mentioned that, you know, if you're a first generation entrepreneur, you don't know how money works. Mm -mm. And I feel like corporate professionals know money a lot different than the first time Absolutely. entrepreneur. And then we have to get through that learning curve to get to a place where we Agreed. get. How often do you get a chance to help people through that learning curve of now that you're you've able to create two solutions to the problem right how often are you able to help people get through that big learning curve i mean i help people every single day so i say that to say that the approach i've taken because i've been doing it so while so so long i should say i really try to get detailed into the weeds and show people step by step yeah. that it's as simple as making a decision now and then being consistent with that decision but it really starts with the mindset so how do i possess the mindset to say hey look if i want to manage my cash what things do i have to change internally today and how can i continue to build upon that foundation so I know that you'll agree, enjoying myself while at work is the vibe that I'm trying to be on. So I want to invite you guys to Sidebar ATL here in Atlanta, Georgia. Sidebar, on top of the good food and live music, they have three different experiences. That means you can join me in the garden room, in the gold room if you want to try the top of the line hookah, and they also have the dungeon where I hear what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. So it's the perfect mix if you're here on business or you want to blow off some steam after work, you can meet me at Sidebar ATL so that you can have a little bit of dinner and then turn up afterwards if that's your jam. So check us out, 79 Poplar Street here in downtown Atlanta, or you can call 678-800-0741. Let's get it, work and play at the same time, right? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Work and Play Podcast. I'm your host, Arielle Young, and today we have an, a financial expert, I would say, here that. to have a conversation with us today. Now, in my own journey, you have been someone who's helped me be a better coach to others. Wow. And I say that because, um, you know, actually, before we get into it, we, we have to say who is, who's in the room. Who, If you're listening, you probably um, don't know yet, but we have Mr. Kenley Conwell, who is here to talk a little bit about, one, his own personal and professional journey, but also give a little bit of insight into what you can actually do as a corporate professional and you're transitioning into entrepreneurship from a financial perspective. Right. I talk about the mental a lot. I talk about like how do you prepare yourself for like that intentional discomfort that you might be, you're leaving a six-figure mm, job, like right? And you're going into like, oh, you're getting your first six figures as an entrepreneur, but there's a process right. to leave that six figures and go into your next six figures. Great. So you're going to be able to give good context on that. But before we get into um, how I know you and even your journey, would you please introduce yourself? Absolutely. So guys, those of you who don't know me, my name is Kenny Combo, aka Mr. Money Savvy. And my entire life I have been an entrepreneur. If you go to my profile right now, the first thing you'll see, because you know people have public figures and all this, I have an entrepreneur. And I've always been this way. Um, I chose to go into the financial services niche or industry when I was in college. So right there at ANT, Aggie Pride, all my Aggies, right? I and love um, that. you know, Aggie Pride. Yeah. But um, I've been in the financial services space. I started in college. I started my first company in college, and that's when I was introduced to the whole financial services uh, industry. And from then, that was like 2007. Um, we're in 2022. Man, I've been doing this for 15 years. Gosh. So <laughs> the, along the journey, I've learned about business and entrepreneurship and um, been able to go out and form um, two successful companies. Um, one of them's name is My Money EDU. It's a financial okay. education platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, we teach people how to build, fix, and maintain their credit, how to leverage business credit, and then also how to, if they want to start a uh, education business, how they can do that. Um, not necessarily make six figures, but how they can make seven figures doing this. So that's my money EDU. Um, at the same time, along my journey of financial, financial, and the reason why I started uh, my money EDU was because as a financial advisor, a person of a color, a lot of the information that I was advising people on, they, that they did not look like me and they needed help with cash, they needed help with credit, they needed help with understanding how money works. So that's why I created that company. Mm -hmm. um, then, um, Probably about five years ago now, I started another company called Capitalize, which is more so a financial planning focused firm where we actually work with clients one on one, specifically entrepreneurs, mm. and we're showing them how they can be the first or next first generation millionaire in their family. Because again, if you're a first generation entrepreneur, you have no clue about how money works. And then when you become a first generation millionaire, nobody gave you the roadmap. 
And then through, our, through, through the experience, um, I've created a, a really solid process with me and my, my, my team to be able to support those entrepreneurs, those people of color, so to speak, on how to make sure taxes and investing and cash flow, the whole nine yards is in order. Yeah. But it starts with education. Wow, I'm thinking um, two different thoughts. One, you mentioned that you know if you're a first generation entrepreneur, you don't know how money works. Mm -mm. And for someone who is a first time entrepreneur, for you, you started very early. Mm -hmm. I'm 31 years old, right? About two years into entrepreneurship, and then I have a whole corporate career, right? right? And so I feel like corporate professionals know money a lot different than the first time Absolutely. entrepreneur. And then we have to get through that learning curve to get to a place where we Agreed. get. How often do you get a chance to? help people through that learning curve of now that you're you've able to create two solutions to the problem right how often are you able to help people get through that big learning curve i mean i help people every single day so you know what i didn't share is like even with my money edu we've i think at this point it's about thirty-five thousand people wow who has joined our programs or started the journey and um Again, my number is going to be a little off, so please forgive me, but I know it's about um, 4 million plus points improved, um, 400,000 negative items plus removed, um, probably close to about 1,700 new homes, 3,800 new cars. I don't know how many lines of credit at this point. Um, millions of dollars in debt paid off, millions of dollars in, um, I think about Again, again, I, I don't know all the numbers Probably. off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. millions of dollars in debt paid off, and then I know about 15, 16 million in, of dollars saved and invested. That's just with my money EDU, yeah. right? But then we have capital wise. So I say that to say that the approach I've taken, because I've been doing it so while, so so long, I should say, I really try to get detailed into the weeds to show people step by step yeah. that it's as simple as making a decision now and then being consistent with that decision. But it really starts with the mindset. So how do I possess the mindset to say, hey, look, if I want to manage my cash, what things do I have to change internally today and how can I continue to build upon that foundation? If that makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. Okay. One of the things specifically that I talk about when I'm coaching is revenue generating activity. Yes. You just gave a rundown of the KPIs that you manage in your business. Right. And I think that a lot of new entrepreneurs mm -hmm. can do that if they focus on what are those revenue generating activities that they are tracking every single week. Agreed. When did you start that behavior? What's so interesting about this is. I have never been one that was not willing to bet on themselves and invest in themselves. Okay. So in 2007, I joined this company called um, Primerica. It was more of a network marketing company. Then realized that, hey, look, this is a great option, but I don't get paid to recruit people. I get paid to sell insurance okay. and investments. But then you can make override off the people who sell insurance and investments over you. Okay. Problem was, I only knew college students. So I had to figure out marketing. So to go back to that question, I invested in this one guy's um, marketing training. Mm -hmm. And I think his name was Dean, Dean, Dean Cipriano, I think that was his name. Okay. It was like 200 bucks, which is a lot of money in college, mm -hmm. but I bought it. And I'm going through this training and he talks about this thing called BPAs. And he called it Big Payoff Actions. Okay. And he said, hey, look, you need to sell, market, or go play golf. Because if you're doing paperwork, if you're doing an admin things, if you're not doing, and he just liked to play golf, but he said essentially if you're not doing selling and marketing, then everything else is irrelevant. And that's when it really, really clicked with me that I need to learn how to sell and I need to know how to market and everything else is irrelevant. Not saying you don't need to do those things, but if you do those things efficiently, then you can put a process in place to hire somebody to take care of the, the admin stuff. Because the problem is when you have a salary, it doesn't matter if it's a BPA or a small action. If it's a copy machine that you're doing or doing paperwork or if you're closing a deal, you're going to get that check. Mm -hmm. But when you don't got a check coming in, you got to focus on getting the check. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, I, it was like 2008. Right. When I uh, got that 2007, 2008. And I was like, man, I got to focus on BPAs. Mm -hmm. And that's when that journey kind of started. And it kind of just evolved from there. But that's when it really, really first hit that's was right. then.
Are you still trying to get a leg up on your entrepreneurial career? Now I told you about the morning meetup, the community that was created for the betterment of entrepreneurship. And we are cooking up some really cool things. Now here's the thing. If you join today, you can actually get in for 60% of the original price. So if you join today, all you have to do is download the app and I provided the link below so that you can join us. We have community, we have a book club and it's the largest group that meets every single day, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. to literally get a head start on entrepreneurship. So if you're still trying to grow, you don't know what your business is going to be, but you know you want to be an entrepreneur, this is the community for you. So check out the morning meetup, click the link below, download the app and join us today. Now he said marketing sales or golf. Why did you decide not golf? He said, I got to do marketing and sales. <laughs> <laughs> I just did marketing and sales, but it was like, but, but it, I, I just never really got into golf, even though I have golf clubs. It just wasn't ever one of those things that I did, but you know, I would just do marketing and sales and just more marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I just became really passionate about really what I didn't say, and I, I'm still unsure or unclear how I'm going to do this is eliminating the wealth gap in the African American community before I pass away. Mm -hmm. Goal is 10%, but maybe it'll do more. So I just became so possessed with understanding money and wanting to help people that I would just do sales marketing and then just learn finance. Like that's all I would do. And then I would work out as well. Yeah. But the point is, it's sales marketing, go play golf. Don't do, and so if you, so what are you really saying is it's a double on conjure. Hey, look, if you make it enough money, you can work less and make more money by going to play golf if you focus on the right activities. Yes. Right. Well, see, here's the thing. I ask you that question because um, early on in my career, I decided to go finance. Mm. And I, I didn't want to, I wanted to go wealth management because of the idea, like you said, mm -hmm. of bridging the wealth gap. I wasn't as informed. But as I learned about the career, it was a lot of the golfing that my, I went to UGA. So oh, we, okay. we pushed a lot of like the networking and the golfing. Mm -hmm. And I was, I chose not to go that route because I'm like, one, I don't feel like I have enough in common with these like white millionaires. And True. I don't think I'd be able to get the accounts that I need to be effective. Right. So when I ask you like, why not golf? For me, I didn't think, I didn't see that as a feasible revenue option for me right. to like be able to do that. That's an interesting perspective. I just didn't like golf and <laughs> I mean, and I and I and I um I noticed that if 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 you got the sales and a marketing down pack you didn't I mean, not not to, not to say relationships don't matter because they do mm -hmm. but if you understand how to con, con, you know concisely communicate your message mm -hmm. then and you and you're solving somebody's problem or pain it doesn't matter if you've been knowing them for 10 years or 10 minutes yeah. they're going to do business with you yeah. right i think you're breaking down a, a lot here and there's so much to unpack so in a short conversation i'm, I'm going to see if we can squeeze enough Absolutely. life experience out of you so we can understand so going back to your decisions in college right to um to study finance and financial um services um, and wealth management, right? What was your idea of success? Because you've been an entrepreneur all your life, but up yeah. to this point, we've taken the traditional path from right. K to, to 12 to college. Right. So what was your idea of success at the time? My idea of success was when I leave a and I'm not getting a job. I'm going to do my own thing and just do a, become a full-time entrepreneur, right? That was, my goal, right? That was my idea at that time of what I would believe to be successful. And it might have been six figures, um, but that was it. Not to have to get, to, not have to do it the traditional way. Got it. Okay. And for you to have that perception, did you plan it out or were you going to like just try a couple things and, and see what popped? So what I started to do was um, I got my insurance license, my between 2006, actually it was 2006, now that I think about this, is when I started this journey. It wasn't 2007. I actually got licensed in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, I started this journey um, 2006. And when I got my insurance license that summer, 7-24-2007, I'll never forget that day. That was when everything changed because I can now literally start to make money because I was referring as a new person, you would have to have a sponsor. And then I was really, cause I didn't understand the game, making him money. Mm -hmm. So I probably made him like eight to $10,000 referring to my, my, my network. But by the time I was licensed, I didn't have anybody else, right? So make a long story short, I just started beating the pavement while I was in college. So I would go to class and I would literally, literally dress up every day. 
So I'm like suited, booted with college clothes, but not college clothes, but I will wear a shirt, a tie, and a suit, mm -hmm. and nice shoes, and nice socks, and I was in class, that's, that's what I did. And then after I left class, I would go to networking events, and I would prospect. I like straight up, that's what I was doing. And then I realized that um, you can become what's called a broker. So in 2008, I got linked up with um, which mentorship is so important guys finding the right mentor. I wish I wish I would have learned about or had a really good mentor Then I got linked up with people who saw my potential, okay. but they wanted to exploit it for their own selfish reasons Ooh, come so, on. so I was getting connected to individuals who did not have my best interest at heart mm -hmm. That's a whole nother conversation having said that though. I formed Conwell financial group um, in 2008 and then that's when I became a broker and I was just figuring it out and then um, I, I, I was going to networking events and then I ended up connected with uh, one of the legal shield representatives and it was prepaid legal at the time and then I realized that oh man it's a lot easier to sell legal shield than sell life insurance than try to sell life insurance and then do legal shield why is that because I was able to sell college students because they were really big on identity theft protection okay. and then legal services like car tickets, you know, all kinds of things. And that was a lot more of a relevant thing to the market that I had access to. And then not to mention all the people I had sold insurance to. So I can like go back and say, hey, look, do you have a will? You don't like, get a prepaid legal membership. And then it was a lot lower and I can get paid faster. Okay. So I started, to, <laughs> I started to really, really sell and recruit people doing that. Um, so anyway, I think- Were you a big fish in a small pond or um, were there other people on campus who were doing the same thing? There were two other people on campus that was attempting their, their market entrepreneurship. Um, I'll go back and I'll look at what they're doing now and they ironically both work for people now, nothing against them. Um, so there were people who had business plans, but no one was out here willing and, willing and dealing and like actually that I understood outside of, let me, let me take that back. There were people who were doing party promotions okay. and that actually is an entrepreneurial activity. So there were people on campus doing that and then you had people doing it the way that I was, well, there were no people that I knew doing it the way I was doing it. Um, and that was, that was primarily it. You know, I started getting money. Like I wasn't a lot of money, but you know, two, three, four grand a month in college is- Right, not struggling. Yeah, I was like getting to the bag. Right, <laughs> meanwhile, you got a lot of us who were scraping to get like a food from the cab mm -hmm. and take it back to the house, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't until like my junior year though. Like it was like my, my junior going into my senior year. And what's funny is I actually started this organization. I just, just, I just realized I did this. I started this entrepreneurship organization. I think it was called Young Entrepreneurs or Entrepreneur Something mm -hmm. in college. And I got, I, I band, I got a, a group of other entrepreneurs together and come to find out there was this other young lady who was doing Mary Kay at the time. Let's go. And she was one of the, she was a part of the network. Obviously I was doing what I was doing. I had another um, buddy of mine, he was doing DJing. So actually I gotta take that back. He was, he was doing his entrepreneur activity. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a couple other people who, who joined this, this band of entrepreneurs that we had, we had created on, on campus. That's dope. Yeah. I was gonna ask, so Aggie is a, a, a HBCU. Absolutely. And I come, I come, I come from a PD, tubby, PWI, PWI, so I'm always curious about, there's, a, there's so many things that I've learned. The confidence that you learn, the mm -hmm. way that you learn to be a, a smart black person, yeah. the, the network that you learn to rely on, all of those things I'm really curious about. But then you throw in the entrepreneurial mindset. As 2022 um, is, you know, we get over Corona, there's so many more entrepreneurs, it's so much more cooler now. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you to band together, one, a group of like-minded young black people, right? And then two, band together a group of entrepreneurs when entrepreneurship wasn't that cool? It was, um, it was, it was, it was empowering, but also difficult because a lot of people, because I'm the college, I'm a college mm -hmm. and, and, and in some cases, in some months, I'm making you know three. I think the yeah the best month I had was like five thousand dollars, right? And I didn't realize that. And then I and then I got a really quick understanding of money management too, because it's just as fast as I was making, I was spending it. <laughs> so I didn't realize. So you know, two things is happening here. But but you know, I'm I'm at a place where I'm making some fairly good money, and I'm in some scenarios making more 
gross money that I'm receiving in my bank account that some of these professors are receiving net. So it wasn't, it wasn't as supported. Now I will say Mr. Heineman, I still remember him to this day, he volunteered every Tuesday and Thursday. And the thing I appreciate about a and is that they created an entrepreneurship certificate program. Mm -hmm. So I found myself going to talk to the professors, but then those professors, although they were professors, they weren't actual full-time entrepreneurs. So I gravitated to Mr. Heineman, and I would always go and share things with him, and I would just get my advice from him, and I would really get my support from him. And what also happened was, is I started to build up a professional network of people outside of ANC who are entrepreneurs, and they really appreciated my energy at the time. Mm. So I started banding with other entrepreneurs in the Greensboro community, and that's kind of like how I got my support. And I would always too, because I was me, try to sell the teachers and the professors and build relationships with them. Yeah. And, and they would listen to me, right? Um, but it was, it, was, it was weird because it was more so like I was being more supported from the adults in some scenarios than I was of my peers. Okay. All my peers thought I was crazy. All my peers like, dude, why don't you just get an internship? All my peers were like, bro, like, what are you talking about? Okay. And so when I had that small group of people who did believe, it was like a little safe haven that we created, like a little community. And it was, it was dope, it was really dope. Um, yeah. I think about, um, to give a little context, I was gonna do this earlier and I'm glad it came back, but I met you um, in the Six Figure Accelerator. Mm. And um, on the day when Donnie had COVID, um, you came in to like, to, like substitute yeah. <laughs> the coaching group. Mm -hmm. And um, I was trying to unlock, you know, how to create something that is going to be sustainable for corporate professionals who right. are leaving. And I do focus a, lot, focus a lot on mindset and I do focus a lot on um, being mentally healthy. Um, but I was trying to figure out how do I create something that is going to be consistent throughout the entire journey? And right. I hadn't, it hadn't unlocked for me yet. Mm -hmm. You helped me understand, well, you gave me one sentence really, you need to look up the wealth triangle. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, look up wealth triangle. And it unlocked a whole new world for me. Right. It gave vocabulary to things that I hadn't had a vocabulary for. Mm -hmm. um, I used to call it a cash cow skill, right? Mm. I used to, I wrote on my whiteboard, what is your cash cow skill? And I just start crossing off things. But when you said, look up the well triangle, it led me to high value skill set. Right. So one, I would love for us to get into that, um, that concept, the, the well triangle. Mm -hmm. But I'm also curious, early on in college, even before you probably had the vernacular, right. what would you say was your high value skill set at that time? Selling, it was selling because when I was selling the prepaid legal membership, there was so much training and support around closing the deal. Mm. And that's when I realized that man, in order, like it wasn't like I created an online program, the way I made the money was my mouth, right? So it was, and then overcoming objections. So that was really what I realized indirectly that, hey, look, if I had to write prospects and I had so many meetings with those prospects, I would convert a portion of those prospects to hit my activity goals. Mm -hmm. So then it, be it stopped becoming emotional to me and more so just say, look, if I meet with this many people and talk to this many people, X, Y, Z amount of these people are going to do business with me. And then the other people who don't do business with me, if I continue to follow up with them. Um, and that was the thing I got from that one training. You want to follow up, follow up till they buy, die, or tell you to go to, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So that was like literally what I ingrained that in myself. So now I'm like, I'm doing all this prospecting. And now I start to now not only create, and this is when I learned about customer relationship management systems, guys, or CRMs. Right, I learned that a CRM can actually become an assistant for you before you get an assistant. Mm. So that's when I learned it, man. And, and I just, I, I did not stop. I just kept that there. I was gonna say, unpack that a little bit. Cause I, I think I know what you mean by that assistant. Okay. Can, but unpack that a little bit. How can your CRM become an assistant for that's you? A good, that's a good point. So if you're brand new in business and entrepreneurship, the thing you gotta understand is sales is the name of the game. Period. I don't, you, we all are all selling. So, so in order to, and everybody's not going to be ready to buy right now, 
right? People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. Which means if you have a solution to solve someone's issue, but they say, I'm not ready to do business right now, can you follow up with me in two weeks? Well, because you're a human, you're going to forget to follow up with them in two weeks. So what you do is, is you set it up in your CRM system and you say, follow up with, remind me to follow up with them in two weeks and let me type the notes, has a baby, having a baby, blah, blah, blah. So now when you call them, hey, just reaching back out to you, how's XYZ doing? People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. So what did you do? You typed a note about whatever it was that they had going on in their profile and then you're reminded two weeks to follow up. So now you start to build up a pipeline and what the CRM does is it helps you keep notes and keep track of your pipeline in your business so that way you can be efficient and effective with doing business with those individuals at scale. So instead of you having to have multiple sticky notes and forgetting about the follow up with the person, you may come on two weeks from now, and this is another thing I learned, is that two weeks actually happens fast in business. So two weeks is gonna be here in two weeks, but it seems like it's not gonna be two weeks, but it's gonna be like, man, it's already two weeks. So you may not have a lot going on two weeks from now, but because you put in your CRM to follow up with all of these people, you may have eight follow-ups, 10 follow-ups two weeks from now, yeah. and then a portion of those follow-ups are gonna say, yeah, I'm ready to do business. So the CRM really is just a mechanism to help organize, track, and maximize your book of business. Yeah. So you can keep building relationships with them and getting business from them. And put it on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Now a person who's listening to you right now might be like, oh, I need to go buy a CRM before that, like to now, right now, right. <laughs> even before they actually leave. But what I like about after I got a chance to look up the high value skill set is that when we're going through that transition of like letting go of our nine to five, mm -hmm. we're focusing all these on all these other investments and right. assets that we think we need mm -hmm. when the real investment is that high value skill set. Right. How did you come to fight? I'm going to tell you, that piece, I told when I, as soon as I found out, I've been telling my clients every single time, whether it's in my group co mm -hmm. coaching or not, and it literally is the cornerstone of our conversations. Yes. Now. It's okay, what am I building? Okay, and if I don't have an idea of it, what's my high value skill set? Right. When did you stumble upon the high value, the um, wealth triangle? <sighs> um, I stumbled upon the wealth triangle probably in 2015. Mm. I think it was 2015. No, probably between, I think it was 2016. 2016 going to 2017 is when I found out about it. And ironically, my accountability partner at the time, who wasn't my accountability partner, told me about it. And I had already been saying, man, the best thing you can do is sell the market, but I hadn't learned it from that perspective. I was like, man, this makes a lot of sense. Cause you know, cause I'm me, me being in you know, finance and all that stuff, like this makes so much sense is what I did. So that's, that's when I learned about it and I, I just adopted it, right? I just like, look, this is it. This is the easiest way for me to explain this process, right? As an entrepreneur, that is. That makes sense. If you could explain a little bit from your perspective of how you took to it, right? Like what was, what was your life like beforehand? Cause you were doing some things intuitively you right. were already in finance and then what did it unlock in you feel free to explain a little bit about like what the wealth triangle yes about. yes yes i'm glad you you, you set that um that stage so um so with, what the wealth triangle is guys is it's your way to literally create wealth for yourself so the the simple way i can put it um and, and i'll say this i've never been afraid to invest in myself so don't be afraid to invest in yourself. Don't be afraid to invest in knowledge. So whatever program she has, whatever program I have, whatever program you're considering, if that individual has the results in their own actual life, then you should invest in it. That being said, the way I'm gonna start the, the explanation of the wealth, the, the, um, a wealth triangle is, let's just say you've got $10,000, right? At any given time, stock market's up, stock market's down, but let's just say you're making 50 grand a year um, or $100,000 a year and you do the old run of the mill way of saving 10% of your income, which is perfect, that's fine. You saving that 10% 10 10 is for the long term, but you wanna leave your job. Well, at best, that $10,000 that year maybe can get you 20%, maybe 30%. So 30% 30 on 10,000, although passive, at, at most, you're gonna make $3,000, right? At least you might end up at $8,000, right? There's a huge spectrum there. But what if you took that $10,000 
and you invested in a program that taught you how to do real estate. You invested in a program that showed you how to make money with Turo. You invested in a program that essentially showed you how to create income. That's the, that's the basis of it. Well, that $10,000, let's just say that program says, hey, look, if you follow our blueprint, and here's a track record of other students just like you, you follow it to the T, you will make six figures in 12 months. The question now becomes, what's a better investment for you at this point? Should I invest in my 401k mm -hmm. with this $10,000? Or should I invest in my skill set with this $10,000? Now, I want to say your skill set. Yeah. So because the skill set can make you $100,000, not just this year, but it can make you $100,000 for the next 30 years. Yes. So that $10,000 investment in your skill set actually multiplies more because you now possess the skill set to create money, mm. right? Now, it doesn't mean, for clarity guys, because I am a financial planner, that you don't invest for retirement. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying at the same time, at the pinnacle of the, at the, of the high income skill set, wealth triangle, is that you invest in yourself and you create a skill set that's going to help you create $10,000 per month or $120,000 per year. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, you are in the top, I think, 5% of income earners. I don't know what it is with six figures. How many people make six figures in the United States? I don't know if it's 5% or 3%. I think it's 10%. I think it's less than 10%. I less than 10%? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you're now in the top 10 to 3% of income earners in the country, which is awesome. So that is the cornerstone. So when you're in the high income skill set phase of entrepreneurship, that means you make you money because what, hap what happens is you said it. We start in business and we start focusing on all these things, but at the end of the day, none of those things have money coming in. Right. And we say, I want to go get a business loan. Oh, I want to get funded. Oh, I want to use my 401k, which is a strategy. Oh, I want to do all of this stuff. But because you don't have a, a plan to create cash, you end up putting yourself out of business. So instead of doing that, you now set the foundation. So even if, you know, business isn't going good, guess what you can do? And I, and I say this figuratively, you can put your ski mask on and you can go close somebody, close a deal and get them to get a result. Not in a bad way, because when you sell, you are helping somebody when you do it correctly. Right. And now you've got, the, you've got the bag secured, right? That's why I say put the ski mask on. You, you ski mask, you go get the bag from the bank, ski mask, you get the bag, right? So mm -hmm. that's the first part. But then the, now, in that first phase of it is you make you money. Now the second phase is now that you create a high income skill set with you make you money, you now put yourself in position to start to create what's called a scalable business. Now, by definition, a restaurant is not a scalable business because a scalable business is gonna take low overhead and not require a lot of financial investment on the front end in order to start scaling that immediately. So the best thing to scale is guess what? Your skill set. So now there's multiple ways you can scale your skill set, skill set, but a simple way would be what if you are doing transactions, doing consulting transactions, but now you can bring somebody else on to do those transactions on your behalf and now you can get a portion of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So instead of you having to do five transactions a month for $2,000, you have this other person that can do same five transactions, but maybe you're getting $1,000 per transaction and they're keeping 1,000. Yes. So now you just created another $5,000. Now the question becomes, I'm making my 10 and now this person's making me five. Mm -hmm. How many more people can, I, I, it only takes me two people yes. in this example to replace my high income skill set, but I don't stop doing my skill set. Now I have 20K coming in. I've got 5K from the two representatives and then I've got my own 10K that I'm making. Now mm -hmm. I start to enter into the scalable business phase because in scalable business phase, the distinction is your scalable business produces cash flow and you make you money. So many people, when they start off in business, they try to take the cash flow from their business and you live off of it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the business can't ever thrive or grow because you're living off the business. So now in this phase, I've got to create cash flow and still keep doing my, my high income skill set. Yes. Does that make sense? I'm following. Okay. To this, to, to this point, is it more savvy for a person to keep their job 
until they their money starts to oh, I'm produce glad that. Glad you that asked that flow. question. Yeah. It's Absolutely. Better. Absolutely. And I'm going to, I mean, let me wrap up this um, high income skill set okay. and then I'm going to tie into that right now. So okay. it's almost like an easy way to do it. And I'm not saying no, easy should be removed. A simple way to do it is to create an online coaching or consulting business that duplicates the skill set that you created. Because once you create the course, the roadmap, the process, that can be sold multiple times, whether you do it or not. And you don't have to be physically present in order for that person to get the result. And now you start to leverage yourself and create cash flow. Mm -hmm. The bottom of the wealth triangle, all that says is you wanna take a portion of your cash flow, take a portion of your income and invest in high return assets like real estate, like the stock market. So you're not taking all the income, but what that does is builds up your net worth. So when you look at it and you're building wealth, assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Mm -hmm. So I've secured my own income my cash flow from my business is producing cash flow, so I've secured cash, and then now I wanna take a portion of my cash, take a portion of my income, and invest in a high return asset that's going to do what? Build up my net worth, and it needs to be conservatively making you 10 to 20, 10 to 13% rate of return. Okay. So, to go into this, when you're in high income skill set phase, and I recorded a video on this, when you really, really start to get into it, the high net worth phase is like long term, but if you're in scalable business phase and you figure out, hey, look, if I put a dollar into advertising, but I can get five dollars out, why would I put my money in the stock market? Now, I'm not saying to be a stock investor, but if I'm saying that I can put a dollar in my scalable cash flow machine mm -hmm. on the beginning of the month, and then that dollar turns into five dollars then it makes sense to keep investing my money in the, scale, in the scalable business because I can get people, I can get staff, I can get processes to continue to grow that thing mm -hmm. out the water, yeah. right? But still take a portion of that money and invest in my high income skill, I mean my um, high return assets. So going back to your question, when is it appropriate or how does that individual transition from their job? I've got some clients um, that had made almost a million dollars in their business before they walked away from, before he walked away from his job. And his wife is still working, right? But the way I break this down is, when should I walk away from my job? Like, what's the number? So the simplest way to do it is, you could say, well, if you can create 10K a month personally, then that 10K a month would replace my income, theoretically. Theoretically. But there are other expenses like benefits, medical taxes, and all these things. So really, the way I break it down is the profit first model. Those of you who have not read or looked into profit first, I highly recommend you get that book. Yes. But I'm gonna break it down. So let's just say your business, let's just say you've gotta replace a 10K a month income. Well, if you've gotta replace a 10K a month income and you wanna go full time, this is the most strategic way to do it. We're gonna break down how the profit first model works. When you do profit first, you wanna, you wanna have a total of four accounts. You wanna have an income account, mm -hmm. and your income is where all of your income from your business flows. Okay. You also wanna create what's called a profit account, okay. hence the name profit first. And these percentages can change, but if you're starting out, it's not gonna matter. 20% of all of your revenue go straight into profit regardless. Okay. So if your business made $10,000, what's 20% of 10,000? 2,000. 2,000, so 2,000 is going into a profit account. Okay. Right out gate. Mm -hmm. Now what we're gonna, because profit is a habit. We made profit a habit. Now we're gonna take another 50% of that $10,000. Okay. And we're gonna put that towards operating cost. Okay, got it, that's the third account. That's the, that's the third account. Okay. So our operating costs are gonna take care of payroll, marketing, admin, whatever that you need to operate the business. Mm -hmm. So we're at 70% right now, mm -hmm. right? Now that leaves us with 30%. Now, we're gonna take 15% and there's this thing called the IRS. Have you heard of the IRS? <laughs> <laughs> You heard of them? Yeah. They want their money. So we're gonna put about 
which is what? How much in this example? 1500 15 of 10000 is 1500 1500 goes inside of our tax account. Okay. And then we take the remaining $1,500, 15%, <laughs> and we pay ourselves in our personal account. Okay, so that's five. The, the that's but it would be five, but the pers the 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 fifth is your real personal account. Got so it. you're paying your personal account mm -hmm. that fifteen percent. So the business has four right. accounts, and I still am a person, so I have my one account. You have your one account, mm -hmm. so you pay yourself that fifteen hundred. Okay. And you can do this. The simpler way to do it is on the first and the fifteenth. So you, you add up all the deposits that you had between the 1st and the 15th, and you do these percentages, and then you add up all your put deposits in, from the 16th to the end of the month, and you do it that way. Now the question becomes, well, Kenny, I can't live off of 1500 bucks. Right. Again, I don't want to keep using the ski mask example, but since we started this, guess what you got to do? Put your ski mask Put your on. ski mask on, and you need to get some more deals, get some more bags flowing okay. until the 15% you are paying yourself is enough to meet or exceed your expenses. Okay. Because now you walk into a financial situation that's totally different. Because again, you, if you keep doing this, you're gonna walk into cushion, taxes, operating expenses, and now you can start to forecast yeah. and think about hiring somebody versus hustle, 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 and start to disrespect yourself for deals and people you have no business doing business with. Yeah. Right? Whew, you said that F word. People don't understand. Like a lot of times when I say the F forecast, mm -hmm. <laughs> where professionals might be like, what? I can forecast my income because a lot Absolutely. of times the thought is I have to get rid of my value of stability or my value of security in order to be an entrepreneur. But what you just built into this profit, by, by using the profit first model, you can go into entre entrepreneurship and maintain your level of security. Absolutely. And what you do is not only do you maintain your level of security and stability, you increase it. Mm. Because you got, now, now the thing, I'm gonna make this, again, we're talking like strategy, practical strategy, mm -hmm. but I mean, again, when you start really getting to the bag and you start making money, and I'm gonna look at you guys directly, when you follow the IRS tax system, you actually pay less tax. I'm gonna repeat that. When you follow the rules of the IRS, you pay less tax. So, okay. what I am saying to you, Mr. and Mrs. Business Owner, future business owner, future first generation millionaire, future CEO of your last name, is that by simply following the rules of how the IRS is classified and is used, you don't have to pay that much in tax. So although you put put aside, let's just say your business makes $100,000 in a year mm -hmm. and 15,000 of the $100,000 went away for taxes. You might pay $15,000 in taxes or you might not pay $15,000 in taxes. And then why am I saying this? There are so many deductions and entity selections and investment vehicles that you can reappropriate as a business owner mm -hmm. and not pay tax because you pay tax on net profit mm -hmm. and depend upon how you show that net profit has a lot to do with the amount that you give to the IRS but the thing about the IRS system is that it favors entrepreneurs, it favors business owners, and it favors, favors investors. Mm. So you now start to go back to the basis of the wealth triangle, and you have the wealth triangle set where you get your high income skill set, you've got your scalable business, which is an actual business entity. We're talking an LLC, we're talking a corporation. Now you have maybe an S corporation election, those kind of things. And then I'm taking a portion of these monies and I'm putting into high return assets. We're talking real estate, we're talking IRAs, we're talking all these type of things. So now I'm really deferring tax or eliminating tax or reducing the amount of tax that I pay. Wow. So you really increase your net worth at the same time doing it this way. And increase your stability. Yo, I understand if you need to listen to this and pause it real quick where we are and take a note, that this might be an actionable step right now for somebody to turn off the podcast and yep. take action. So I understand 100%, do what you gotta do. But I think that uh, there's someone who's saying, you know, how to, still, right? What, what, how, right? Bro, what, are you, what are you talking about? You <laughs> just told me straight up. My CPA is saying, 
we get the IRS and I'm telling you, you should love the IRS. And the reason why I'm saying that is because when you understand how money works and you understand the system and you get entrepreneurship and you want to walk away from your job, you really realize as an employee, you are in the highest tax class. So the way you earn your income by definition is going to slap you around. You got federal tax, you got state tax, you got this FICA thing, you got this, uh, all these other little taxes, and then not to mention sales tax, gas tax. So at the end of the day, your dollar is really taxed at about 60% as an employee. Mm. But when you become a business owner, when you start to follow the system, you can really start to reduce that tax down to 37%, down to yeah. 25%, down to 15%. Yeah, when we get into the numbers, and I don't like, I don't, this is how my mind works, but when we get into the numbers and we think about practically, there's someone who's like, I cannot wait until my, my, um, my profit account or my personal account from 50, goes from 15 to 10, 10K. But I also think about the calculation where you say, if a person who's living their life right now is only taking home, they're living off of 40% of their income right now, mm -hmm. then I feel like they're probably not living off of the 150K that they make right now as they, as they think they probably are. Probably not. So there's a mind shift that needs to happen to understand like the offset of, or the value that we place in our nine to five. Right. And how much you really do live off that 150K versus how much do you really need to live your life That's a good to point. transition. That's a good point. And that goes back into on a personal level, because I want to make sure we're clear, guys, that don't leave your job until the 15 percent you're able to pay your business can meet or exceed your expenses. I'm going to break this down right now on the personal side. So I want to make sure you guys got this so that well, we're clear. You got four business accounts, income account, profit account, operating account, tax account. 20 percent off gate goes to profit. That's the savings. And you can use that savings to reinvest back into the business. 50% goes towards operating expenses to take care of the day-to-day -day in the business. 15% is going to go to tax because you still got to pay a little bit of tax. But 15% is way better than the tax you're paying right now, ain't it? Mm -hmm. And then you got 15% you pay yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's break down the 15% you pay yourself, and we're going to get into personal finance real quick, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so I call this the three-bucket approach. And it's really, really simple. Budgeting, I don't know if you realize this, doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. What works, because you're going to do the budget, and then you're going to start looking around, and then you're going to pull the money out the savings account, make a quick little transfer, look around, buy them shoes, do this, do that, because you got the money, but you ain't really had the money because you was following your budget, but your He's budget was too lying. tight. He's like, well, I was trying to do the budget, but now I'm out of that budget. Right. Right? You ain't got to, I, I know, I've been doing it 15 years. I know how I go. Right. That's what you're doing right now. You're using your savings as a put and take account. Right. And take. So what we have to do is create what I call a three bucket approach and project just like we project in business, a cash flow strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, the three bucket approach works this way. You have your past commitments, you have your present choices and you have your future needs, wants and desires. Past commitments, future choices and present past commitments, mm -hmm. present choices, mm -hmm. future needs and commitments. Got it. So I'll give you an example. You said something just now about we may be living off of 40%. And that 40% may be our past commitments. Mm. Keeping this really simple, this means this is the absolute bare minimum. I got to keep the lights on, overhead in. This ain't including food. This is making sure rent, mortgage is paid, car payments is paid, minimum credit card payments is paid, yeah. utilities, all those things to keep me afloat. I've already agreed to make these commitments in the past and this also helps you from a standpoint of making sure you maintain good credit. Because if you in your past commit in your past commitments bucket make sure the car is paid, the mortgage is paid, the minimum credit card payments is paid, that's going to ensure that you don't at least mess up your credit from a late payment perspective. Okay. Right? So we have to identify that number. So let's go back to the 10K per month. So let's just assume that $5,000, which is a very lofty assumption, I mean, not lofty, but it's a re really good um, lifestyle, 5,000 or 50% of the 10 mm -hmm. that you receive net is going to get going to fix expenses. Let's just say you have a family, you've got kids, you got all that stuff. So all of that stuff goes towards that. Now, in this example, we still have $5,000 left. Yeah. So what do we do with this? Well, typically what happens is the wheels fall off in the present choices. Mm. 
meaning we're shopping, we're going out to eat, we're buying shoes, we're buying clothes, we're going on trips, we're stunning, for, we're living vicariously through the gram as if we got it when we ain't really got it, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what we're doing, straight up. Mm -hmm. And either A, we have no money going towards our future bucket, which our future bucket is 401k, IRA, savings account, all those things, and now in my present, I'm blowing my money. But let's just say you're a good person, you're not blowing your money. I think it's conservative to say, hey, look, I can take in, if I'm making 10K a month net, I can live off 500 bucks a week. I can use that for going out to eat, groceries, you know, maybe get my nails done, whatever the case is. You know what? Let's throw in, get your nails done, hair, hair done. So let's say $2,000 is for food and going out to eat. And then we give another thousand bucks in this example for all the other miscellaneous stuff that still leaves us two thousand two thousand mm -hmm. dollars right and we can use that two thousand dollars for a number of things we can use that two thousand dollars i call it i'll call it active versus passive investing active investing is taking that two racks and investing in guess what your skill set taking that two thousand dollars and investing in something that's going to help you make more money taking that two thousand dollars and here's here's the thing christmas is happening is it happening at the same time this year? <laughs> yep. It's not going to change, is it? Mm -mm. What about Thanksgiving? Same. And the birthdays and all the other trips? We know now. Guess what else is going to happen? I'm not wishing a flat tire on you or a broke water heater or life, but life's going to happen. So it's probably appropriate that we put money away for life because when life comes a knocking, it's going to be inconvenient. You're not going to want to take care of it. And now instead of it turning to a financial strain mm -hmm. because you focused on building up your reserves. So let's just say you don't do anything else. You just focus on getting two grand a month for 12 months consecutive, consecutively. Now you got $24,000 just chilling. And then when the good old life happens, it turns into an inconvenient, excuse me, instead of it being a financial devastation. So now a, a flat tire, a broke water heater, you know, mama, cousin, brother, sister, whoever needs the money, whatever the case is, happens and you just stroke the check and it doesn't throw off your plan. Yeah. And that's how you want to manage your money on the three bucket approach personally. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. I'm definitely going to have to replay this okay. and take note. The best way to support the Work and Play podcast is by subscribing to the YouTube channel and by going to your favorite podcast player to subscribe and rate the Work and Play podcast. That's all you have to do. So if you are liking the Work and Play podcast, the content, the stories that we're sharing, and you know that this will help someone, go ahead and share the content to someone who could actually use it and help them on their journey to transition from corporate into entrepreneurship. Now let's get back into the episode. Uh, but it, it makes a lot of sense as you speak about it and and when you live your life in that systematic type way Like you said it turns something that could be a crisis for some people mm -hmm. into just like you said an inconvenience It's just an inconvenience whatever. It's yeah. not a big deal. You got the money. Yeah now back into your story before we started the episode You were saying like I never had a job in my life, right? Nah, and <laughs> I got we got well, I have I had I've had a job, but I got fired from all of them <laughs> even, even, but yeah. even more interesting, right? Right and and you you know you we have to get into that part of your story because um, one, there are people who may not feel like, oh, that's possible or that's impossible. And so I think that hearing your mindset and how you actually like lived your own career, it's helpful for people to understand like, okay, so what's possible for me? Like what's the mindset that I need to shape in order to do this? So the first thing I highly recommend, I'm gonna recommend books. Mm. The first thing I recommend is personal development and it's daily. You know, I'm, I'm assuming you brushed your teeth this morning, you got, you took a shower, you did all those things. It's like a daily thing. On the journey of entrepreneurship, you've got to feed your mind every single day. So instead of feeding it with music, you want to redirect that and start feeding your, your, your mindset with what's possible. So there's a book I'm going to recommend. The first one is going to be called, um, um, was a couple of them, right? Um, the first one is, is uh, it's not called The Morning Meetup. That's actually a podcast. The Miracle Morning? <laughs> miracle Morning. Mm, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I still, Miracle Morning. I cannot, you, are you? I you, love the Miracle, L, L, and Crown, I think. I, yep. Sorry. Miracle Morning. Right. You, you want to get that book. Another book I'm going to recommend is called The Compound Effect. Mm. So The Compound Effect is very similar to The Miracle Morning, but that book literally changed my life. Mm. 
I was aware of the compound effect because of uh, prepaid legal, but that is going to be another thing that I recommend because I'm only saying this to say that what, I, what I've done is I've always been a reader. I've always listened or read books and it helped me from a mindset perspective realize that when I don't feel like doing the activities, yeah. I made a commitment to the activities, so I'm still going to do the activities whether I feel like it or not. Yeah. So that was very, very helpful. So, you know, along my journey, when I first, you know, my, my first job I got in high school, and it was at this company called Advanced Auto Parts. And at the time, I was cutting grass, and I was making two to four hundred bucks a weekend just cutting grass. And then I went and got this job the, the traditional way, and I worked all this week, and I got a check for three hundred dollars. I'm like, man, I'm out of this. Like, so I kind of like when I went to A and T, I quit that. I never went back. Mm -hmm. And that was my first job. Now at A and T, I didn't really have a hustle like I did in North Carolina, which was cutting grass and washing cars. So I had to figure something out. So I ended up getting another job at this company called Express. Um, and I had that job for a few months and then I kind of like, was like, man, you know what? I'm kind of out of this. So I got out of that job and then I learned about something called Cutco and then oh, yeah. that's it like was Vector when I was Vector. There. It was Vector Cutco, <laughs> right? And he said $15 an hour and I was like, man, 15 bucks an hour back at the, you know, um, years ago, that was a lot of money. So it was saying either $15 an hour or if you, or commission. So I started selling knives. And I was making some pretty decent money doing that, right? But I kind of got out of that. And then I learned, I got into the whole financial services thing. And I was like, this is it. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of like how I, you know, did my thing. And then when I did graduate from ANC, I didn't initially have to get a job. And, um, but in order for me to move back to North Carolina, I had built up, I mean, North Carolina, Charlotte, I had built up most of my client base in Greensboro. So I did temporarily get a job at Wells Fargo um, retirement. And I'm glad I got that job because it helped me understand 401ks and retirements and all this. But I was there for four months and I quit, mm. right? And I quit after I bought a brand new car. And I had just bought a brand new car. I even used a pay stubs to get approved for the car. And I quit, but it's like, I can't do this. And then that's when I went full fledged into, um, and I was still doing my like insurance stuff on the side and my prepaid legal stuff okay. on the side, but that's when I went full fledged into um, financial services entrepreneurship. Okay. And at that point, you know, I just, I joined a company in Charlotte. It was like a, one of those things where you're in business for yourself and not by yourself. And that's when I started this whole entrepreneur, like full time journey, making commissions. And I'm listening to your story and I at first I, I gasped because you bought the car right before you quit and someone yeah. could say like oh my god how did he I'm what I was thinking was how did you pay for the I car on, I, I pulled out the ski mask <laughs> and started hitting the pavement and I did what I had to do right <laughs> that is the thing that you know it's it might seem fa you know uh, far far fetched for somebody right. but if you that's a decision that a lot of people would that would hurt a lot of people mm -hmm. it would take them into debt it would take them into like a nah. negative credit score nah and you did exactly what you're telling us to do which is mm -hmm. put on that ski mask i put on a ski board. mask man and not only did i just get a not only did i um um just get a car i also got an apartment a few months prior or going you know i had got an apartment a few months later with a business with a with, he's not my business partner but we went half on an uptown appoint, uh, apartment, mm. right? So, so now had so I had to, like I had to, I had to get it in and I did, yeah, yeah. you know, I think that first year, I think I made like uh, 45 grand. This was like 2010. And then in 2011, I remember having my first $14,000 month. I worked so hard to make that money. Like, I mean, so hard. And one of the things I noticed about money is when it rains, it rains. And when it pours, it pours. But entrepreneurship really is the activities, right? Yeah, being consistent in those activities. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that mitigates some of that? It does, mm -hmm. it does. And that's when I learned you have to keep your highs low and your lows high. And I didn't take my own advice at the time. I didn't realize how much I knew. Mm. So going into, and this is a good story and I'm gonna wrap it up really quickly, but going into um 2012 i was like yo i think i closed out the year like 65 maybe 65,000 70,000 which that doesn't seem like a lot of money but as a self-employed entrepreneur in 2010 off the back of the, the the whole financial crisis and not having any leads or anything that's pretty good in my opinion absolutely right so but i had just, so going into 2012 i'm like yo i want to make six figures right that was my goal and 
I stopped doing the daily activities that got me the money to focus on one deal that was going to make me, uh, well, collectively, it was gonna, one, of, one of the deals was going to make me $100,000 and another deal was going to make me like $40,000. So these two deals were going to make me over $140,000. Mm -hmm. And I had a chip on my shoulder because it was like uh, they were showing favoritism in the firm and giving other people accounts. I'm like, you know, I'm coming for that guy. Y'all giving him all these accounts. Y'all ain't giving me nothing. I'm coming for him. Well, I'm going to wrap this story up pretty good. Um, I put all, I put, I went all into this deal. Stop doing the daily activities. Leverage my credit. Leverage my cash. Got other people's money. Leverage their money. And the deal didn't go through. Mm. And I could not afford my half of the rent in August going into September when we were moving out the apartment. My roommate had to cover the rent. And he was tight about that. Mm. And he was moving. And my car had went out for repossession. And it got so bad I had to move back in with my parents because the deal did not go through. I'm, I'm leveraged to the hilt. And I remember hitting rock bottom. This is like 2012, I'm, I'm 25, turning 26, started new everything. And I realized, and this is a key moment for every entrepreneur listening to me, that in this rock bottom state, I had to get a job and my, my buddy had let me use his car because mine was out for repossession. So he was driving my car because I knew they wouldn't go to, go to this house. So at this rock bottom state, I just decided, like, man, I got to get a job, right? I got to get a job. Now, I went back and I, I got a couple of deals that I had in the pipeline closed just to kind of keep me afloat between like October and December. And one of the people I owe money to called me and I pick up the phone by saying, I ain't got it. Like, cause I'm thinking she calling me about the money. I'm like, look, I ain't got it. You know, I'm good for it. But she's like, no, 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 no. I'm not calling you about the money. I'm calling to tell you about this opportunity in Atlanta. It's a sales opportunity. I think you would be great at it, Kenny, based off what, what I know. You don't have to do anything um, regarding like prospecting. They give you leads. All you gotta do is sell. I said, really? And she made a connection to the, to the, um, to the guy who ended up being, becoming a later business partner and I decided to, to, to make it happen. Now that happened while at the same time, I was creating another firm with three other partners and they were saying, hey look, with this firm that we're creating, if you're leaving the previous firm, which I was still with, you can take that book of business and then I can guarantee you maybe like 1500 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not really sure if I wanna do that, I'm gonna take the job in Atlanta. So I take my car, that's out for repossession by the way, all of my clothes and an ironing board, that's all I had. I fit it in my Mustang and I drive to Atlanta and I get the job. And I get the job January 19th, I interview all this stuff, I moved to Atlanta, I moved to Buckhead. Now mind you, I moved to this place. Um, at the time, the rent seems, this seems so small now looking back at it, but the rent was like 1100 bucks. Okay. And I had four, I had the, the accounts that I was telling you about, I was doing that back then. I just wasn't doing the percentages. Okay. I had four business checking accounts. Now, I had just enough money to pay for my de security deposit because my credit was messed up at this point and pay for the prorated fee for the month. But I started on January 19th. You know this, when you start a job, you got three weeks in a hole, you won't get your first paycheck. Right. It's a three weeks. Right. Rent was due in 11 days. So what I had to do was... I had to overdraw my bank accounts. Oh. I, over, I was with PNC at the time, and PNC would let you take the cash out. I overdraw all my bank accounts mm -hmm. to make my first month's rent, and I am below broke. I'm not even, I'm past broke. All of my checking accounts are negative, but I had a sales job. And at that point, you, you got paid 15 bucks an hour or commission. I got one base check, and then every other check from that was straight commission. And then I dug myself out of that financial hole and ended up making um, close to $90,000 that for 2013. And the majority of it was just getting myself out of that hole. And while I'm in this apartment, instead of buying a bed and a couch and all this stuff first, I bought a desk. So I can keep doing my side hustle while I'm still working at this job, the sales job. And then eventually I bought a couch and then I bought a bed and then I got myself out of the hole and then I was able to get my car from not being repossessed and pay everybody back. And that's when I really, really 
started back with this whole entrepreneurship deal because in September of that year, I had already planned to walk away from that job. Now, in September of that month or this year, I was also the number one salesperson at the company. And when I was planning to put in my two weeks notice, because I told them it was my birthday coming up, they sat me down and said, well, Kenny, we're letting you go. Mm. I said, well, I appreciate you because <laughs> I was already going to leave. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I went on to start my insurance brokerage here in Atlanta in 2014 to 2015. I was out here doing what I had to do, beating the pavement, making it happen. I started doing marketing and I was still doing my financial services stuff on the side. But the point of this story was from 2015 to 2016, that's when I made my first six figures. And along this journey, I kept doing personal development and tracking my finances. And also along this journey, because I did mess up my credit, I realized that I needed to start the journey of improving my credit because I had made six figures. I was only insurance license. I did not have my investment license. In order to take my business and create my IRA, my RIA firm, I had to have my Series 65. I didn't have it yet. Mm -hmm. So guess what I had to do? I had to fix my credit. And guess what? There were investment insurance companies that would not do business with me because my credit was messed up. Okay. So that's when I started the journey um, in 2015. Um, I think it was 2014 going into 2015. No, 2015 going into 2016 of uh, fixing my credit. I'm going through an emotional roller coaster right now, but you are pushing through. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm listening to your story and I'm hearing all of the different opportunities come for you in a way that sometimes you can't, you cannot plan for a woman to call you and offer you a job when no. you're in your lowest of, your, of, of lows. But I'm glad she did. You know what I'm saying? Me too. But then also for you to push through, you know, you have this mindset where you're moving forward. Uh, the uh, some people get caught up in the credit score being low or the the bank account being overdrawn. What were the feelings, even if you didn't wallow in it? I accept the full responsibility, and I um I think that's what you have to do is like you just have to own it. Like you just have to say, hey, look, man, I accept full responsibility for this. It is what it is. I can sit here and cry about it, or I can make it happen, yeah. right? So you know, and I just I just decided that that wasn't going to be my re that I decided that my current circumstances wasn't going to be my future reality. Yeah. I just decided, and then I just made it happen, um, and. Again, I just I just believed in myself and again, yeah, it was some risk, but when I and it, but it goes back to the very essence of the high income skill set. Like I am literally paying myself out, I mean getting myself out of this hole by selling. Yeah. Doing something that I had to do, my back was against the wall. And then started to recruit people under me when I eventually left that job. So I'm doing, you know, we're doing 30, 40 policies a week. You know, so that, you know, little 5, 10K turned into 10, 20K because I'm getting overrides and stuff. And like, it just, it just, again, compounded, right? Yeah. Um, I know we're, we're coming up, um, come, I, I can keep going on in this. Yeah, no, I'm curious, why'd you get fired at the height? Like when you were number one seller, uh, seller. I think I got fired at that job, if I'm being honest. Um, um, I think I got fired because like, the, 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 the manage I was I was uh, the, I was making the management uncomfortable. Got it. It was politics. Yeah, I was making it, and, and even my manager specifically, because what started happening was, is that the reps started coming to me and asking me about, well, Kenny, how did you close this deal? And I started sharing my calls. Like this is a person that I closed. Like listen to this call. Listen to this call. Listen to this call. And then in the meetings, the manager was giving terrible advice and. He didn't go to bat. Well, now, I will say, I got to accept responsibility for this. And it had happened. But it was this one lady who was, like, giving me all of this flack. And, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I was like, hey, look, listen, lady, there's nothing I can do. Go make some more money. Click. Like, I can't, I can't change the price. But mm -hmm. she was rude. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, so they leveraged that. Got you. They leveraged that. That moment of like, <laughs> yeah, they, less than perfect. They leveraged that and yeah, said, yeah. hey, look, we can't have this type of behavior. Oh. But it was really the under underlying fact that, hey, look, yes, you were the number one salesperson, but you weren't fitting our culture. Yeah, yeah. We didn't like the culture that you were creating and how you were usurping some of the management and basically making us look bad. So we got to let you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're OK with a, a, a 70 percent because I even 
me being me created like a a thousand dollar per day blueprint in their model come on i did and they, you were getting ready to say i will take a 70 a 70 percenter you're right <laughs> I'm like, this is how you make a thousand dollars a day doing this and i never made a thousand dollars a day officially but i got close to having like a 500 buck day right yeah no i understand it i i'm glad you mentioned it because regardless of whether you stayed employed for a long time you touched on a lot of things that employees experience all the time for years right for seven years they might be dealing with someone who's like, you're used surfing I'm, I'm good i know like, whatever, i know like and and so honestly and truly i think that your story is amazing and like i told you me because i'm feeling your story i'm like oh my god i'm holding on for dear life but you're you're pushing through and i think mm -hmm. that's why you're where you are today i think there's only one other question that like i'm curious about and in this space like as you're starting to share your personal life a little bit more and obviously my my number one coach um who helped me the first coach who helped me into entrepreneurship is donnie right mm -hmm. as you're going through all this and i'm curious as a woman right as mm -hmm. you're going through this what are you thinking about your personal life and how did you find space or time to build a connection with yes. a woman where we are where we are today that's a whole nother podcast yeah. to be honest with you okay. but um like i didn't meet donnie until i was our when i met donnie um i was making 100 grand a month Right, so I was already like at a different place. Mindset. So you weren't grinding. Yeah. Okay. Like when I met Donnie, I was like low key kind of giving her some tips and stuff that she should do to kind of get a run good away from it. She was really sharp at the time as well, but she had a lot going on, and and I just gave her some some suggestions at the time. Let her tell it. She was just flattering me, but <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Right. Well, because the thing is, we know what we know sometimes, but then it's like. If you're not doing the thing that you know, then you right. might as well just not even know it. And, the, and, the, and that's so powerful because it's a quote that I live by. To know and not to do is not to know. Mm -hmm. Let your results prove your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened, and then it was, it was so, and this, this literally is a podcast itself. So literally with, with, uh, with uh, Donnie, we, we actually met through Shans. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I really didn't have like that much of a, uh, a personal life. I mean, I did, but I didn't. Like, I just was work, work, work because, you know, my previous relationship, you know, had ended and that ended. And I told that previous relationship, these are the things I'm going to do. And at the time, that person did not really understand or see the vision because they were comfortable making their six figures. And I'm like, yo, if you get six figures, six figures is not a lot of money. And, and I'm not, I say that humbly, guys, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but but when I realized that I was making 10, 20 grand a month and I still had all these other things I wanted to accomplish, I realized that, hey, look, there's another level. And I, got, I did eventually get burnt out doing it that way. I got burnt out trapping insurance and, and doing it that way. So I was like, it's got to be a better way. So at that point in 2016, going into 2017, that's when I really started with my money. It was KennyConvo.com at the time. But I really started with that and I put out all the information that I knew, all the courses that I invested in. And I told my buddy, one of my best friends, G at the time, I was like, hey, look, bro, this is what you need to do with your business. And he did it. Mm. And he created a multi-million dollar business. And I remember calling him. He had made like forty, fifty thousand dollars This is like in 2016. Like I'm out, in the, I'm out in the hood. He's like, yeah, I made 40 grand today. I said, $40,000? I'm out here trying to trap a policy for for like 500 bucks. Why am I doing this? And you gave him advice. I gave him the advice. So at that point, I was like, "Yo, like I gotta put my money. I gotta put my um, money where my mouth is. My back was against the wall." So I did that, and that's when I went in and I created KennyConwell.com and my digital program, and I haven't looked back since. In that year, going into 2018, you know. I think I had made over 200, close to a quarter million dollars that year, between 200 and 250, I don't remember the numbers exactly. And that's when I went all in on the digital side and then at the same time kept doing all the principles. But again, it went back to the fact that I just decided that I was gonna make this happen and I was gonna go in this new direction because I'm over here seeing buddies taking my advice and I'm not taking my own advice and I just had to take my own advice because I was trying to infuse all the things that I learned to attract recruits and insurance and all that stuff. But I just said, hey, look, I gotta go digital. And then when I made that decision that year, um, I did in 2018 end up letting people know that, hey, look, I could do financial services. And I remember having my first 80K month and it was off of one deal, right? But that deal came from 
all the other activities that I was doing. Yes. And then in 2018, I did 550, man. And then I didn't look back, man. 2019, I think we did close to 900 to a million. 2021, 1.4, 2022, close to three. Like, I, mean, I just kept, it yeah. just kept getting bigger and bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And, but it all started with that decision, yeah. right? Um, so anyways. You never lose track of the activities. You right. always, you always come back to the activities. Always, but I, I went off on a tangent because you brought something up about my, my significant other in our relationship mm -hmm. and it it started when I was in that 2019 phase doing I think I did do a million I did that 2018 going to 2019 going into a million dollar year and I told her straight up I I could we need to go find a text message hey look if you're not talking about spirituality working out this I ain't got time like I don't know what what because we had we had linked up for a little, well, we, we spoke on the phone because Shan was trying to link us up because I knew what it took, right? I knew what it took. And I was like, man, like I ain't trying to do this, like straight up. Um, I wish I could find a text message. She's like, well, I don't know who you think you're talking to. What makes you, I just said you were cute. I didn't say I wanted to be with you. And that's kind of like how we started our relationship off. Like, hey, look, I'm not, I ain't about to BS, right? So we can try to make this happen. But, and then we kind of like, it just kind of just evolved from there, right? Um, that's important. I think that that's exactly what, in terms of the Work and Play podcast, um, and as a woman and as I am on my journey to build the life that I want as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. to hear what I'm hearing is, what I'm hearing mm -hmm. is, because you had gone through your grind years, right? You were in a space where you, you knew what, how to communicate even what exactly you wanted to be in your life. Mm -hmm. And then there's a woman, I understand uh, for men, it's not who, it's when, and for women, it's not when, it's who. Mm. And so you went through your grind years, you knew what, like, what you wanted to pour into your life and what you wanted to like plant seeds, and you communicated that, right? So you were at a point where you were ready to bring that in. And even still it had its like relationships, yeah. ups, ups and downs. And I'm sure that that's, that's the whole podcast. Mm -hmm. But I think that the takeaway is for you, you, you focused on the business first and then the relationship came second. I think for women, we, we probably do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We try to do it all. I know I do. Um, and it, even in my comments, they're like, we got to do it all. Uh, but I think that for the, the takeaway is that like it came a point where even as a woman there was a man who helped us even get clear in and what the business and i'm saying us because you're a representation of a man who right who could be um on his grind and we are living our work and play life and then we build something that we're we're um, proud of together right. i think that the takeaway is that for a man he might focus on the grind yeah and a woman is bringing in a little bit more of we would have to listen to both podcasts to be yeah we, we probably both. would and, and but you're, you're right and, and it's and it's interesting about this and all my fellas that is uh listening to this i highly recommend you listen to a book and women um called the superior man it's a very very like that book oh you do I do. it's a very interesting book it's, it's really powerful and it's, it's actually very true about masculine and feminine energy i mean the thing is is as a masculine male i still do have feminine sides and feminine energy and as a feminine female you still do have masculine sides and stuff but it's the polarity but that being said as a man you know especially like a chosen man that, that that's you know does these things it's like not easy so you've got to be able to stay focused and steadfast on what you're trying to do and hitting your purpose your purpose is your number one calling. Mm -hmm. It's not your relationship, right? And that's a tough pill to swallow and it's mm -hmm. tough for some women to get that, but they will indirectly, secretly resent you if you put them higher than your purpose. Yeah, right. exactly, yes. So you gotta, be, you gotta realize, fellas, that your purpose is the number one thing and if you don't know your purpose, mm -hmm. don't get involved with a woman mm -hmm. because now you're going to be leading her because she's going to follow you and that's not fair or cool to do that so get your stuff together first and then go and try to get the woman right and if you are gonna do what you're gonna do physically it's a two-way street don't manipulate the woman into making herself seem like 
she, you, you want to do this when in fact you just want to do the, the activity. Hey, look, she's a woman. Hey, look, just be your friend. Where hey, look, I, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm looking to do. Let her set the stage, and now she's now she got a decision to make. Either she's gonna be like, yeah, I want to deal with that, or no, I don't want to deal with that. But even from a deeper level, you still shouldn't even set that stage because it's still you're the leader, right? And she's only gonna follow you. What women do is I, I, I made this video about this, and it's very similar with women. All money does is amplify. All credit does is amplify. And what you give a woman, she incubates and amplifies, which means if you give her chaos, she's going to cuss you out. If you give her sperm, she's going to give you a baby. If you give her a house, she's going to give you a home. So if you're unclear and you are chaotic in your mess, when you latch that onto a woman, she's going to amplify and return back to you what you give her. So you've got to be at a place where you are solid on what you're looking to do before you get entangled physically because you're, you're, and I said this before, there's a difference between your emotions, your feelings, and your physical desires, and I'm talking to men. Your emotions will have you making bad decisions and doing all kinds of stuff that you have no business doing. You're going to get emotionally hijacked. Your feelings, your actual feelings are your intuitive self that is connected to your higher power that's infinite. And when you get that feeling here, oh man, I, I, I should have listened to myself. I felt this, I felt that. That's really God trying to communicate with you. But if you're not doing the daily discipline of study and prayer and all this, when that feeling and that voice speaks to you because you're so emotionally hijacked, you can't hear it. Mm. Then your desires, fellas, because that's what you're doing, your physical desires, you're thinking with that head, not this head, you're leading this woman with the physical desire. So you might physically want her not be, and knowing your feelings and saying, I got a bad feeling about her, but my emotions and my, my, my desires is move, making me want to move forward. But then you ignore what God told you to do, now you're doing something and you're perpetuating a cycle that should be ended. And it stops, it starts and stops with your self-discipline. Now, a lot of people are gonna challenge me on this and you're not gonna wanna hear this. But another thing that you have to understand how to do is redirect your sexual energy. Mm -hmm. Fellas, you've gotta redirect that energy that you want to release and redirect that into your creative, energy, your creative self. So that means not going out here and doing those activities and redirecting that towards your purpose and then latching on and letting a woman who should receive your seed receive the seed and help you amplify that. Otherwise, you're going to continue to attract the same exact thing that you are. You don't get what you want. You attract what you are. So I said a whole bunch there, but really the point is understand where you are. And if you're a man of purpose, which you are, if you're listening to this, realize that before you get emotionally entangled with an individual, are you ready? And it, it, you're not going to find the perfect partner, and that individual is going to bring out sides of your personality, which that's another book, Spiritual Partnerships, I highly recommend you listen to it, it. Um, <clears throat> that you're not going to be aware of. And now you've got to understand, am I at a place where I can deal with this, or do I want to focus on my career? Do I want to focus on, do I want to be selfish, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's how I end this. It's okay to be selfish. It's okay to be to yourself. It's okay to take some time and do some things and build into yourself so that way you have clarity as a man or woman. So that way when you do enter into that union, you have done the work necessary so that way in that side of your journey that you're able to take it to the next level. Yeah, that's a perfect way to close it out. Perfect way to close it out. I could not have asked you any better questions and you could not have gone off into any other tangents better than that. Mm -hmm. I think that um, even though it might seem, well, hopefully you guys know at this point, I get into relationships, I get into business, I get into the, the finance of it all. Um, and so hopefully you guys can understand that as you're building your life of work and play as an entrepreneur, as a woman or a man, specifically as a woman, because I think that you just kind of spoken to me in a way where, um, you know, the life that I'm creating, I can actually focus on myself for a little while. Yes, you know what I mean? It's okay. That's actually really uh, freeing. So the last thing I'm going to say is for, and, and you can speak about this uh, financially as like financial advice or as life advice, but for someone who is making their journey, they're making that transition from one financial foundation to another financial foundation and the reason I frame it that way is because you are wealth management but what would you say to that person who is on their journey to make that transition um, and they need to figure out like how to make their next step um, 
Go back and listen to what I talked about regarding the high income skill set, what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Really follow the profit first model and then really apply the three bucket approach model because that's, I mean, that is the blueprint. That is the so blueprint. if you follow that, you'll, you'll be at a good place to be yeah. able to be successful. Um, I would even wrap that up from a, a life experience. He, one thing that he said that I picked up is believing in yourself. And I know it sounds really right. um, weird, but you said that personally, I think professionally, you mm -hmm. guys got the three bucket system. So you got everything you need. If you have any other questions, if something that Kenny said to you reached you and you are like, I want to continue following this man, I want to support. Kenny, how can they connect with you? You guys can connect with me on Instagram at Kenny Conwell. That's K-E-N-N-E-Y C-O-N-W-E-L-L -L on Instagram. Um, also, Mr. Money Savvy on Facebook. And um, I, I dropped not a lot of content, but I have a lot of content on my page. So feel free to uh, connect with me there. And um, I'm happy to serve you. I would tell you to, you can text me, but I don't know what my text number, my, my, my number is. <laughs> okay, well, everything is going to be in the description below. So all that information, whatever you need to do to connect is going to be available to you. Do what you got, do what you have to do. This was a special episode, honestly. So much information and a lot of notes that I'm going to have to go back and take as well. So until next time, do what you need to do to follow your purpose. Peace out. Peace out.